Hello, welcome to the Inspiration Program. Today on the show with me is Judge Vanessa Gilmore. Uh, we're in her uh, Houston studio and um, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be with you today. Brilliant. Let's go straight to it. You are a judge in the city of Houston. That's a big deal. Tell us a little bit about your work. Well, I'm actually a federal judge. I am in the city of Houston, mm -hmm. but I am a federal judge, and that means that I was appointed by the President of the United States, mm -hmm. and we are appointed by the President for a lifetime appointment. I was appointed by President Bill Clinton in 1994, so I have been a federal judge in Houston for 20 years. Excuse me. So this is a much bigger deal than originally thought. You're a federal judge and state judges um, have something to say about state law. You have something to say about the law of the land, the entire United States. That's correct. Federal judges preside over cases that arise under the federal laws of the United States, the Constitution, or about disputes that are between citizens of the United States and citizens of other countries or citizens of different states within the United States. The only higher level we could go is to the Supreme Court. Well, there are actually three levels on the federal court level. There are trial judges like myself. Uh, that's the district court. Then the next level up is the Court of Appeals. Uh, there are about 175 judges on the Court of Appeals, about 675 judges on the district court. And then at the very top is nine judges on our Supreme Court. And uh, we've had a Supreme Court justice called Thurgood Marshall. I believe he's the first African-American Supreme Court judge. Was he an inspiration for you? Absolutely. In fact, uh, one of the law schools here in Houston is actually named after Judge uh, Justice Thurgood Marshall. It's called Thurgood Marshall School of Law. It's at Texas Southern University. Brilliant. So um, in your line of work, you come across young people sometimes. Sometimes we do, but we come across all kinds of people, uh, actually. One of the things, though, that uh, I did notice was that uh, a lot of the people that were ending up in the criminal justice system uh, were ending up there uh, as a result of having previously lost one of their parents to incarceration. Uh, in fact, in the United States, about 75% of children who have previously had an incarcerated parent end up incarcerated themselves. So it's like a cycle that goes from generation to generation? It is, but there is a way to break that cycle. And I think that that's a message that a lot of young people need to hear. That just because your parent made a mistake or made a poor choice doesn't necessarily mean that that's the choice that you have to make for your own life. Brilliant. And um, you, you're not only a judge, but you're also a writer. And you wrote a book on this, Things You Wouldn't Believe. Can you give me the title of the book? Well, that's my, actually my second book. My first book was a book called... A Boy Named Rocky, which is a book for children whose parents are incarcerated to help them deal with some of the issues that they face having lost a parent to incarceration. Uh, and that book I really enjoy because we use it in the courts to help people uh, with uh, children uh, so that their children can uh, get the kind of help that they need um, uh, even if they have lost a parent to incarceration. And so that book has helped us have some very successful programs. Uh, my second book was a book that really uh, uh, talks about my life on and off the bench. It's called You Can't Make This Stuff Up, uh, Tales from a Judicial Diva. And right. It's kind of a lighthearted uh, look at some of the uh, interesting and funny things that have happened to me as a result of being a judge. Wow. So your job does not require you to reach out in any other way than to dispense judicial um, justice judgments but you are effectively uh, operating beyond the boundaries of your job title and doing more by trying to address not just a legal issue, but a social problem. You know, I think that you're right. It doesn't require us to do that, but I think that all of us as citizens have a responsibility uh, for trying to be a light in the world in mm -hmm. whatever way that we can. Mm -hmm. uh, and because I noticed that there were so many children who were really hurting uh, from having lost a parent to incarceration, uh, and, and the thing that people don't understand is that even though I have the responsibility of incarcerating people, we also have the ability and the resources to help them and their families uh, with having uh, an opportunity uh, to have a better life. For us, uh, someone who goes to prison is going to eventually get out. Uh, and so for us, one of the things that we are looking to do is to uh, cut down on recidivism, that is cut down on the possibility of people reoffending. And one of the ways that we have found 
that is helpful is to make sure that family units get to stay together, that people have an opportunity to uh, uh, interact with their family and be with mm -hmm. their family during their period of incarceration. And so we do certain things like make sure that we uh, incarcerate people as close to their family members as possible. And the program that we started uh, at the courthouse uh, to help get the children and families, uh, family treatment and counseling ahead of their loved one's incarceration so that they can smooth the transition in a way for their children. We also started a clinic at Texas Southern University at the law school at Thurgood Marshall School of Law called the U.S. Pretrial Legal Clinic to try to help people with some uh, minor civil problems that they might need like guardianships and wills and landlord and tenant issues and social security and other things that would make the transition easier for their families. I think that it only helps us uh, as a court system to put people and their families in a better position to have success later on. And to the extent that we were able to do that, I think that we do look at that now as an additional responsibility. Now, I've been on the bench 20 years. We wow. didn't always think that way. Wow. Uh, there was a time, I think, when we really thought that our role was punishment mm -hmm. and retribution mm -hmm. uh, and not so much rehabilitation and mm -hmm. helping people figure out how to become um, um, active and successful members of society again. But we are working much harder on that part of the issue now as well. That's brilliant because people all over the world, when they think about Texas, they think about punishment and retribution. Um, but here we're talking about a model of rehabilitation, and restitution, and um, reintegration into the society is really important. Successful reintegration is successful the key. Successful reintegration. Mm -hmm. But do you feel that in reintegrating the offender in back into the community. Sometimes do you think that the community needs to be reintegrated as well? So well, we work with the young with, with the with the offender, mm -hmm. but should we be thinking about structural work with the community to so not just as we have a term the politicians used in in England, tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime. Do you think that that's a way to approach um um this reintegration business to be tough on the causes of crime to, you know, to make well, a, one of the causes for us, mm. uh, when we allow someone, uh, when someone is released, uh, we don't just throw them back out there and say, good luck. Right. We, I still have to supervise people for three to five years after their release. Right. Okay. And so the, then we call that a period of supervised release because we know that there are going to be many temptations that could result in somebody reoffending. Mm -hmm. Drugs being one of the number one things. Right. Uh, the majority of the people that we release, they end up uh, getting in trouble using or mm -hmm. drugs again, sometimes very soon after their release. We don't immediately reincarcerate somebody just because they've used drugs. Mm -hmm. What we do is we start trying to figure out how to get them into the programs that they need to be in to help them stay clean, get clean and stay clean from right. drugs. So we supervise and manage their lives for mm. three to five years because that is one of the causes of crimes. If you right. start getting involved in drugs again, if you don't have regular work, we make sure that they have regular work. Brilliant. We make sure that they're paying their fines. We make sure that they're paying their child support. We make sure that we know where they're living, that they're living in a place where mm -hmm. there's not a lot of criminal activity. They have to report to us on a regular basis. So right. it's we you're free but we're still helping you transition back into the community because a lot of the things that you're going to run into as soon as you are released are some of the things that got you in trouble in the first place and so we try to be there to be a stopgap to make sure that that doesn't happen brilliant brilliant mm -hmm. i want to come back to this business of doing more than one job but before i come to that there are over one million lawyers in america in, <clears throat> in america a very small percentage of those lawyers will have the opportunity to go and argue in the federal court. An even smaller percentage of those lawyers will then move on to be sit on that bench. What was your what was your motivation for being a judge and what were some of the challenges you faced? And how did you overcome those challenges? Well, David, actually, I really need to take you back a little bit further than that. Please. I need to take you back to why I even became a lawyer in the first wow, place. Wow, okay. Because when I went to college, what my dream job was, was to be a fashion buyer, to buy clothes. All right. And so I moved to Texas specifically to work for a department store here in Houston called Foley's Department Store, which was right. a federated right. store. It was the, uh, it was the uh, name of the store before it became Macy's. Uh -huh. And so I worked there as a buyer buying clothes, going to fashion shows and mm -hmm. buying clothes for the store for the most part. Mm -hmm. And uh, one weekend, now this is going to take us way back, 
Uh, so your, your young people won't know anything about this because there was a time when there were no cell phones, there were no answer <laughs> machines, That's right. there was no pagers or beepers. If someone called your house and you weren't home, they didn't just got a ring. And if you were on the phone, they just got a busy signal. Wow. That was, that was in the olden days when there right. were dinosaurs still walking there. <laughs> anyway, <That's right. laughs> I went out of town one weekend and I didn't tell my parents where I was going and they got alarmed. And so they called the apartment manager and said, asked them to go inside and look around to see if I was okay. Well, I was a photographer in those days. I had a lot of photography equipment. I had a dark room in my house. I was wow. really into fashion and photography oh, and, wow. and all of that. And so they went into my house and they looked around and of course everything looked fine, but they decided to help themselves to all of my camera equipment. And so when I came home, my front door was unlocked with a key, not busted open, mm -hmm. just wide open. And all my stuff was gone. Wow. And so I called my parents. Of course, they told me, well, we sent the people in there to look for you. So I went to the apartment complex management and I said, somebody took all my stuff. They said, oh, no, you probably had a break in. Well, I didn't live in an area where there was right. very much break in activity right. at all. And so I said, no, that's not what happened. Somebody came in and they just helped themselves to my stuff. Right. So they were not going to help me. A friend of mine talked me into going to the law library to look up how to sue them. Mm -hmm. And so I sued them under a theory called res ipsa loquitur. Res it, ipsa loquitur, the thing speaks for it itself. It speaks for itself. That's, That's right. exactly right. Brilliant. And what spoke for itself was I had a key. They had a key. Yes. Someone came in with a key. All my stuff was gone. They were responsible. Brilliant. Brilliant. And so I sued them and I went to court and I tried my little case and I won and Fantastic. I got my little money and I thought, hey, I think I'm going to do this some more. Fantastic. So I hurried up and took the exam to get into law school mm -hmm. and just barely had enough time. And I got into law school at the University of Houston. And that's how I decided to that's leave beautiful. the world of fashion and, yes. and become a lawyer. Wow. <laughs> so that's a true twist on the term fashion victim. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. But, not quite, not but, quite. But, but, and then to prosecute your own case. Yes which is the pro se defense representing oneself representing yourself which you can do anybody, which you can do because the constitutional there, sometimes right if you are wronged you have to take the law into your into own into your hands. own hand yes that's beautiful that's and yet you got justice i got justice it done. worked for you it did and so even before you set foot into law school you became an attorney. I, I I did representing myself. Representing yourself, which of course a lot of people don't understand that everybody can do that. Everybody anybody can, do can that. file their own lawsuit that's representing right. themselves, pro se as well. That's what right. Called. Yes, that's so fantastic. That's, what I did. that's, that's what I did. brilliant. So I mean, you were you were um, you were you were destined for the law. It, the opportunity was just awaiting, and you had this um, event that really thrust you and catapulted you into the legal system, but from wow so so from so from going to this self-representation to now being appointed by the president of the united states bill clinton well okay so then that was still that was still a, a ways in the making so yes. i went to law school mm -hmm. i finished i went to work for a, a litigation uh firm i did i was a trial mm -hmm. lawyer um and i did that for 13 years uh one of the things that uh i also did was um, I became very, very actively involved in the civic community and I was mm -hmm. on the boards of a lot of organizations and I worked um, uh, for the uh, YWCA mm -hmm. of Houston. Uh, I was the president of the Y and in 1991, uh, we had a woman who became governor of Texas. Her name was Ann Richards and she was a rather Richards. famous mm -hmm. uh, governor of our state. Mm -hmm. And she decided that she wanted the state to be uh, run uh, by a group of people that reflected and looked like what Texas looked like. That, right. uh, she wanted to make sure that there were women and minorities running the boards and commissions mm -hmm. of this state. Uh, and so she pegged me and asked me to come and uh, help run the Department of Commerce, which mm -hmm. was the agency responsible for business development in the state of Texas. And so um, I did that as a volunteer job mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, for about three years from 1991 to 1994. Uh, and then uh, as a result of doing that work, which really just was, you know, volunteering to try to bring more businesses to the state, mm -hmm. uh, I met a gentleman 
by the name of Bob Kruger, and he uh, was later appointed by the governor to be uh, a United States senator when one of our senators uh, left to go work in the Clinton administration, when Senator Benson left. And uh, as a result of knowing him and having worked with him uh, for some time, uh, he was the person who actually nominated me or recommended me to the president. Wow. Uh, so it was really as a result of doing other volunteer work for the state mm -hmm. uh, that I ended up getting to know the person uh, who would ultimately recommend uh, me uh, to the president to become a federal judge. Wow. And so one of the things that um, I think that I found was so important to me during the confirmation process is it's not necessarily the, the most brilliant person there, but it's the person who is smart, prepared, mm -hmm. but has also shown some uh, effort to be involved in the community and dedication to the community and to work in community service as well, because being a federal judge is a public servant job. And so mm -hmm. it's not just mm -hmm. I'm the smartest box, you know, smart, smartest crown in the box. It's, it's I'm smart. And I've also shown that I'm willing to work and do some things to better the community that I live in because it's a public service job. Right. So it can't be just that you're smart. It has to be uh, that you're smart and that you're willing uh, to be of service to your community. And that was the thing that actually ended up helping me a lot getting through the confirmation process uh, was the fact that I had been so involved in a lot of community projects. Right, right, doing other things. So, provoked by a burglar, prompted by a governor, promoted by the president. What's next? What's next? Well, uh, I've been on the bench now 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, as I spent so much of my life um, just really working, working in my job, working in the community, um, largely, I would say, uh, at the expense of my personal life. And so I woke up one day and realized I thought I've done everything. It seems like I forgot to do something. I got it, went to school, got a good education, got a great job. And I thought, oh, I forgot to have a baby. Yeah. And then I thought, you know, parenting is not something that I intended to skip this lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I had something to offer to a child. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to adopt my son. And so I adopted my child. Uh, I was 44 years old when I adopted wow. my son. That's why I'm wow. the oldest mother of a 13-year-old in the world. Probably not, but in probably any not. event. Um, so I adopted my son. Uh, he was a newborn baby in um, 2001. Mm. And um, it has been a true blessing for both of us, I think, for my life and uh, for his. And what became so interesting to me is seeing how different the life was that he has uh, with me than the life that he might have lived growing up with um, his birth mother. And I thought, that's just such an interesting story and mm. a story that I thought maybe I should tell. Mm -hmm. But then I felt it wouldn't really be fair to tell his story because his story is his story. Right. And you can't take your child's story. Right. And so I decided to write a fiction novel called Saving the Dream, mm. uh, which uh, alternately tells the story of a young boy and the life that he lived growing up with his birth mother and the alternate story of the life he might have lived growing up with his adoptive mother, mm. sort of a sliding doors story going back and forth between the two worlds that might have been. Yes. Mm -hmm. For all the professionals out there who have sacrificed and uh, built their careers and come to that point, that juncture that you came to where you thought, hold on, I forgot to have a, a child, as we put but <laughs> And they may not... Having a child naturally might come with challenges with older people. Mm -hmm. It could be a male as well. Um, adoption. That's a good option, isn't it? It is a very good option should... for having a family. At the end of the day, you know, somebody put it to me like this. What was your goal? Is your goal having a baby or raising a child? Mm. And if your goal is raising mm. a child, mm -hmm. then it ultimately, ultimately, it doesn't matter if you've had a baby or not. Right. And right. if you keep yeah. feeding them, they start looking like you. That's right. <laughs> and, you know, that's interesting you said that because... Um, you know how like, people start looking like their dogs? Yes. Or they, well, also, partners start to resemble each other. Right. That's you know, right. Love, you know, people you love, you resemble after a while. That's and they exactly love, they right. resemble your back. Um... But there is something so interesting about that connection with the African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In other words, we don't really need to dwell on biology. We can major on sociology. 
it's all our children. And we should be reaching out to parent, mm -hmm. whether it's through adoption, fostering, mm -hmm. helping out at the local community. So that's, that's brilliant. But speaking of which, the life chances of a child, given the environment they were raised in, mm -hmm. your child, and I believe you're co-inventor with your child of a product. Well, no, I'm not the co-inventor. He's I the cannot, sole inventor. My son is the inventor. I will not take credit away from my child. Wow. My child invented a product. He entered an inventor's contest right. when he was in the fifth grade, uh -huh. and he won the contest. Wow. So he came in second, and he was able to show his invention at uh, the Children's Museum of mm -hmm. Houston. Mm -hmm. And at the Children's Museum, there were hundreds, hundreds of kids there, and they said to him, if you built this product, we would buy it. So he came to me and he said, Mama, I want to build this. I want to make my product into a real product because people seem to like my idea. Mm -hmm. You are an investor at this point now. And so I'm just the investor. I'm right. not, I, I'm, I have no I have no stake in the inventing part of it. I was just the investor Inve and mm -hmm. decided to invest in his dream, which was to bring his product to market. It took him two years. He did four prototypes over a span of two years mm -hmm. until he finally got the design right. Brilliant. We had some early design flaws. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, he brought his product to market just this year, started his business in September, the Sleepover Bed Tent Company. And the wow. Sleepover Bed Tent is, the, is a, a tent that fits on a full or queen size bed. Uh, that has a drop-down center panel that divides the bed in half so everyone has their own private sleeping space, space on the same bed. On the same bed. Oh. What an invention. Yes. So parents don't have to go rushing out buying extra beds. Right. They can just fit two children on the same bed and, if you and have, they have their privacy. That's right. And if you have company, like during the holidays, yes. and you don't have enough beds for people to stay, you can put the sleepover bed tent up. So it can be used for adults as well. Exactly, because it fits on a, a full or queen size bed, so it just divides the bed in half. Wow. So you don't have to worry about putting those pillows down the middle to make sure you don't roll into somebody. We, have to, really, <laughs> we need to get very worried if we see husband and wife start buying that thing. Well, you know, it could keep peace in the house, though. Peace. Well, it could be an implement for peace as well. That's exactly Sometimes right. Sometimes people need a space. You know, and also it could spice up the relationship, right. you know, because uh, separation breeds... At you least know, the heart grow fonder. Make the grass grow fonder. That's right. So yeah. it, so it's, it's so when you need an occasional break from that special yes. loved one, yes, that can also go and drop it on your queen size bed. <laughs> queen size bed. That's fantastic. <laughs> so we've covered quite a bit. Um, we, no, so what I want the point I wanted to make on that is that. So can we take away from this that you don't have to be limited to your job? If you are a lawyer or a plumber, or you can be something else too. You can run a business. You can engage in another business. You're a writer. You're an author. You're also what role do you play in, in your son's business apart from? Well, I'm, I'm the director. Director, because of, he's under 18, so of course he can't actually right. sign anything in right. a legal contract. So I'm just the director. You're for the that director purpose. for him, right? Um, so really, speaking to our audience, really you can. We, we're capable of doing so much more than just one thing in life. Oh, I think, you know what I think? I think that sometimes you have to look for other outlets for your creativity. Yes. And you have to um, do things that appeal to your intellect as well as your heart. Mm -hmm. And sometimes our jobs only fulfill one part of, of our personality right. or satisfy one part of who we are as a being. Yes. And it may satisfy our intellectual curiosity, mm -hmm. but it may not move our hearts in any way. Right. And so for me, the writing was an opportunity to um, delve into the more creative side of mm -hmm. my personality and to do things that sort of appeal to my heart work. Right. Uh, and helping my son with his business is just really... I. I win even if we don't make money right. because yeah. he's learning about business. He's That's learning right. how to be a public speaker. He's understanding the manufacturing process. He's understanding what it means to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, he's trying to get into high school next year and Brilliant. people are impressed that he yes. has already figured out how to have a business and he's just 13 years old. So Fantastic. there are a lot of, of, of advantages and things that we gain from his involvement in his own business at this age that go beyond the financial. Brilliant. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, those things are incalculable mm -hmm. because of all the lessons he's learning around mm -hmm. business, but also working with people and so on. And talking about creativity, you're also a big lover of art and you have some amazing pieces. I in do your, love in your art. Life. I enjoy art because art, again, it's something that feeds the soul, doesn't That's it? Right. Yes. It feeds the soul. And so I really do enjoy, uh, enjoy art and uh, I enjoy cr creative people. I don't think that I'm that creative myself. So it always is interesting to me to see how 
creative other people can be right. and how they, uh, the, the, the outlets that they have for, um, uh, showing the world their creative spirits and their creative sides, because, you know, all of us have to have different gifts, right? And you have That's to work right. within whatever gift that you have. Yes. So it's nice to be able to see and admire the gifts that other people have. Brilliant. Well, I, I sense a, a poetry legal event at your courtroom at some point. Maybe we can collaborate, but that's, <laughs> that's for another conversation. How can we leave the program? Is there a, a final, not that there's a final word, but there's a word that you want to leave with the viewers in terms of all of this that we've been talking about? Maybe you want to. So You know, sometimes I think that you don't understand that every obstacle that is put in your path is uh, not necessarily bad. Mm -hmm. One, there's a proverb that says that, you know, smooth smooth seas don't make for skillful sailors. Mm -hmm. You have to have some bumps in the road be yes. before you're able to learn. I mean, I take some of the things that have happened in my life, even, you know, having my apartment burglarized, that could have just been a, a bad situation. Mm -hmm. And it was a situation that, where I, I took lemons and turned it into lemonade Lemonated. and turned it into something that worked for me. And even, you know, even in my own personal life, not having a child at the time that I thought that I was going to have a child. Everybody has their own dream in terms of what their life is going to turn out to be. And sometimes it doesn't always turn out the way that you uh, guessed that it was going to turn out to be. My favorite saying is, you know how to make God laugh? Tell him your plans. Because sometimes hmm. you just have to hmm. be willing to understand that you can't have a testimony without a test. And sometimes sure. the tests that you have make you into the person that you ultimately become. And it's hard to see it when you're living through the hard part of it. But when you get a little beyond it and you look back in hindsight, you can say, oh, I had that test because it w enabled me to work harder on something else or to leave something behind that I didn't need to take forward with me into my life. Because mm. some things that we think we need and we try to hold on to are things that don't work out because they're really not for us. Wow. Uh, and so we have to just keep moving forward and just have faith. Uh, Absolutely. And, uh, and, and know that sometimes you don't get the lesson until you've already lived through the hard part of it. Lovely. That's a wonderful note on which to say until next time. We've been talking to uh, Judge Vanessa Gilmore. Uh, Judge Gilmore, you're a phenomenal woman. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you.